Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Voice of Saskatoon with Civically Speaking. And I'm here as one of the co-hosts, Lenora Swiston. I'm going to hand it around to my other co-hosts, and then we're going to jump into a really important session, talking about the state of health here in Saskatchewan, focusing in on some wonderful guests that we have here today to give their insights, share their wisdom, share their experiences, and take some questions that we have for them. So over to you, Anika. Yeah, my name is Anika. You guys have seen me, host the, uh, the Voice of Saskatoon. So I'm very excited to be here with three of our great guest speakers that we have. And we'll be talking about some very important topics. And yeah, I hope you guys enjoy the show. We'll be coming with more shows in the future. And make sure to follow our Facebook page, The Voice of Saskatoon, and Civically Speaking. On to you, Rashid. Thank you so much, Anika. Good evening, everyone. And my name is Rashid Ahmed, and I'm one of the co-hosts for Voice of Saskatoon. And I'm looking forward for today's conversation on healthcare system. And thank mm -hmm. you so much for all the guests mm -hmm. uh, for uh, joining us today. Over to you, Madhurja. Thanks, Rashid. Uh, we have a really knowledgeable set of guests today. My name is Madhurja. I'm proud to be a host of this show, and hopefully you'll enjoy the show. Awesome. And so we've got our first guest online. Dr. Haroni, and I'm just wondering if you can share a little bit about yourself. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Shaila Hirani. I'm an associate professor at the University of Rajana Faculty of Nursing. Uh, my area is maternal and child health nursing, and I'm also a certified lactation consultant. It's my great, great honor and pleasure to be here with mm. you all at this wonderful show. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. And then turning into the studio here, and it's great that we're able to do this because yeah. it really widens our access. So we're really appreciative of that. So thanks for joining. So we're gonna go next to Tracy. Tracy, yeah. share a little bit about who you are and, and what you yeah. do and anything else you'd like to add. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just a little. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll keep it brief. Uh, Tracy Mugley, and I'm the executive director at St. Paul's Hospital here in Saskatoon. I'm a social worker by training and mm -hmm. profession and I've worked in uh, this realm for 35 years and the, uh, 10 of it being with CPAS, which is the organization that helps connect people to home mm -hmm. care, long-term care, et cetera. And then 10 years as director of mental health and addiction services. And now I'm at St. Paul's Hospital. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah. she's just a little busy these days. <laughs> a little, yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> for sure. And thank you for coming on because we know that we've had uh, both you and who we're going to speak to here right away, Dr. Kendall, you know, we've had you on a few different episodes of Voice of Saskatoon and Civically Speaking, particularly during the mm -hmm. pandemic, and just much appreciate uh, the wisdom and experience that you share through that and the fielding of participants' questions. So thanks for joining us again. Thank Dr. You. Kendall, please share a little bit about yourself and your background, mm -hmm. and nice well, to have um, you in the studio today. Family physician by training. Uh, but uh, probably in relation to what we want to talk about today, my uh, most significant experience in my career was uh, serving for 15 years on the board of directors of the Health Quality Council. Mm -hmm. I did a stint as their interim CEO and uh, through that really uh, got to uh, gain much insight about health systems, what works well and how you, know, you can continually improve health systems. And uh, I was privileged to serve with two other citizens on the panel that recommended creation of the health authority. Mm -hmm. And uh, our hope was that would lead to better integrated care for people across the province, because often rural people found their experience quite disjointed when they had to go back and forth between rural and intermediate and tertiary settings. And um, so I, I, with that background, I... Uh, I have done a lot of consulting mm -hmm. with governments on contract to try and improve things. Sometimes those have been really positive experiences, sometimes mm -hmm. they're frustrating experiences uh, because you sort of hit a wall sometimes. Yeah, for sure. And I think we'll hear a little bit about this because we know current context of health is it's not a great one. Let's mm -hmm. just say that. I think we can share that. We're we're here in a in the kind of the sacred space of the of the couch and the virtual couch, yeah. you know, and we're here to have a conversation today. Mm -hmm. So we've got some questions, but if you have questions of each other, mm -hmm. you know, with your various different backgrounds and expertise in that, I think this will be a really good show, and uh, mm -hmm. hopefully, the listeners will yeah. have something that they can take mm -hmm. away from this and and maybe even apply into their own lives mm -hmm. in some way. 
So here we go, Anika, over to you. Yeah, perfect. So the first question is, we would love to know what you guys think are the biggest opportunities and challenges in our healthcare system today and why. So I'll start with Dr. Kendall. Well, I think the opportunity, mm -hmm. which is always ongoing, is to optimize the actual care experience for mm -hmm. people, regardless of where they live in the province. Yeah. We have a vast space to cover, and so it's challenging, certainly, to provide good comprehensive mm -hmm. care in small communities, intermediate communities, and our large cities. But uh, ideally, we need to tailor the services to you know the, the needs of, of the community. And uh, I really feel it's important that we listen to people in the communities about what their experience is as they actually access care so that we can then work with them to improve mm -hmm. it. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I love that and I do agree. Coming from people who are actually in the front dealing with things, when you get that feedback, it's a lot more impactful and that can help make a big change if you're listening and getting that feedback from the people who are actually in the front lines. So mm -hmm. no, thanks for the answer. Mm -hmm. Tracy? Opportunities. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that we're on the cusp of, of a lot of technological opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, AI may or may not be helpful to the situation, mm -hmm. but, but I do believe that there are technological solutions now that are being introduced that can save a lot of money and save a lot of uh, time in mm -hmm. hospital, uh, return quality of life. I'll, I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. We have uh, just introduced robotic surgery at St. Paul's Hospital. Oh, wow. And for thoracic surgery, we can reduce length of stay, recovery time in the hospital from what would have been two weeks just last year to two days. Oh, wow. So if you think about that technological <laughs> advancement, you can actually serve more people. And when you're doing thoracic surgery and you're, you're addressing somebody's lung cancer, time is of the essence, mm -hmm. right? People need quick yeah. access. So I think there's some interesting technological solutions. Uh, with, with robotic surgery, there's even now technology that uh, we're just kind of looking into. Um, that can biopsy, uh, lab test, and remove all in the same procedure. Oh, wow. So can you imagine mm -hmm. um, being in an OR, going in for a biopsy and coming out and being told, we just removed mm -hmm. your cancer. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. So there are some interesting yeah. technological opportunities mm -hmm. ahead. Um, I mean, a lot of them are going to involve a lot of money yeah. as well. But I, I think on the technological side, um, and hopefully there are opportunities too for just electronic mm -hmm. health records so we can mm -hmm. bring people's stories together. Yeah. They're so disjointed right now between mm -hmm. service providers that you can't uh, put the story together to get a full picture of mm -hmm. what someone's experience is. Mm -hmm. So lots of opportunities there. Again, expensive, yeah. but really necessary. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Perfect. And, and you're right, it is going to be an expensive investment, but I feel like long term that could save a lot of time and money yeah. just once it's in place. But yeah, no, thank you. Yeah. Love that. And Dr. Harne, Har sorry, oh my God, I'm so sorry for mispronouncing your name. <laughs> Shayla, go ahead. Thank you so much for this important question. I would say that um, I would actually refer WHO's definition in here mm -hmm. because the way WHO defines health is that health is a state of complete physical, mental, social, emotional, and spiritual well-being and not merely the absence of disease. So whenever this definition we are using as a reference, we would come to know that what are now the gaps in our healthcare system? Is mm -hmm. it the like all the aspects of health are well tackled in our health system or not and definitely the answer is no mm -hmm. we most of the time are treating the physical conditions but we do have lots of patients who are uh, with so many needs that are like mental health needs mm -hmm. the social connection there are emotional issues that they are going through while being in canada because there is so much of the isolation in most of the communities that there are many times when people don't have access to the healthcare system because they are living quite far from the major cities where hospitals are located. And also like spiritual care, I would say the another aspect, which is very, very important, like many times 
that's something very much uh, very easily overlooked but even cultural aspect and religious aspect is equally important so um, referring back to who's definition that the way it is being proposed as having um, providing the community the best opportunities for having the greatest level of the physical mental social emotional and spiritual mm -hmm. well-being should be something that i look forward to mm -hmm. as a next level of opportunity in our healthcare system in canada that's something really requires more kind of a thoughtfulness mm -hmm. and apart from that like um, i'm also an active researcher um, in canada working very actively with the immigrant and refugee communities and what i came to know through my interactions with uh, the mothers and the mothers especially who are with the young babies and also are in a state of uh, um, the the state of di displacement they mostly came from other parts of the world either as a refugee or a either as an immigrant and most of the time they are the one who face so much of the racism in our healthcare system which is not at all healthy mm -hmm. in in any ways and here like i would share an example like sometimes um sometimes like people impose their own values and uh, beliefs and uh, kind of an expectation on others and i once encountered a refugee mom who had like uh, six children already and she wanted to go ahead with her seventh delivery the labor one was like due in few days so somebody was a like person who was a translator for her like um, proposed her that uh, the healthcare providers have given her a form to sign without explaining and when she was in the hospital she even signed a form without getting the literal translation for that document and after her seventh baby the next day she was taken to the operation theater and mm -hmm. later she realized that it was the the procedure for her tubal ligation because people who were uh, sponsors or healthcare providers uh, they felt that seven children are too many for her but after that like this lady end up into so intense level of the postnatal depression and later she was into the PTSD and then she was undergoing number of treatment and wasn't able to well attend her all seven kids with with all her functionality as before so this is just one uh, an example of such case but there are many such cases like those and i always think for those kind of the uh, population in our canadian healthcare system who actually need the kind of the culturally appropriate care and services so that sometimes is so much missed out that people really end up into more issues and again going back to world health organizations definition that no matter that physical mental social emotional and spiritual well-being could not be like taking care of in that scenario where something else or some some kind of an external forces are not giving them a greatest support at their level best perfect no thank you so much for the answers and yeah i loved hearing from all of you Again, list taking feedbacks, incorporating technology, and taking a more holistic approach to healthcare past that physical. So, you know, thanks for sharing the answers. And yeah, over to Madhurjo for the next question. Well, I think I think we got to yeah. spend a little bit of time yeah. here, though, because there's the challenges aspect to it. Mm -hmm. So, Dr. Ari kind of linked into some of the challenges, which I really appreciate too, in terms of if we're going to really address those those. It, you know, health from a holistic end. Mm -hmm. So back over to you, Tracy, kind of picking up, because yeah. you talked about the yeah, technology can be used for yeah. the good and we can get more efficient and we can get more effective. But let's flip to that challenges mm -hmm. side, because I know well, off air we were saying there's there stuff. Yeah. Perfect segue, because one of the key challenges I see is the wellness of children and youth Yeah. Um, in that technological yeah. world. And I'm very worried about the mental wellness mm -hmm. of youth in our society. Um, just last, I was having coffee with one of our emergency physicians this morning, and she said that last night in our hospital, 80 to 90% of the people that she was dealing with were uh, substance use and mental health related uh, presentations in the emergency department. 
So the, the um, presence of substance use and mental health is so magnificent right now that mm -hmm. uh, that really, really worries me mm -hmm. as one of the greatest uh, issues. And we have to be able to look to youth and kids to find mm -hmm. ways to, to build resilience, build coping skills, and also make sure um, we address the determinants of health, that there's, mm -hmm. you know, food security, income security, mm -hmm. that they're safe. So that that's one of the biggest mm -hmm. um, challenges, challenges that I see is protecting, supporting mm -hmm. uh, our youth. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, could I offer a comment about yeah, the social determinants of, of health? So it's interesting. Um, one of the interesting things I'm doing right now is serving on an advisory committee with the seniors mechanism of Saskatchewan. Mm -hmm. And they received a four million dollar anonymous uh, mm -hmm. contribution to yeah. help uh, implement social prescribing on the part of physicians. Now, physicians are generally thought of as being very sort of you know uh, focused on disease as yeah, opposed yeah. to the you know the social mm -hmm. determinants of health. But there's really good evidence in other parts of the world that uh, if you uh, engage people in um, a way that connects them with other activities in the yeah. community it, it enhances their health as has been mm -hmm. suggested and so um, they're starting out with uh, two projects uh, over the course of four years they're hoping to get a number of projects uh, one's going to be starting in Moose Jaw one in a smaller mm -hmm. community and uh, so in each community there would be a, a role called a community connector mm -hmm. and a physician or it could be another member of the primary health care yeah. team in conversation with the patient would say, I'm going to put you in touch with a community connector mm -hmm. and this person will help you identify uh, resources in the community that uh, will enhance your health. I'm quite excited about wow. that. So that's, that's brilliant a, yeah. because that's isolation is such a huge yeah. indicator of mental health yeah. for seniors. Exactly. Yeah. 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 But let's, let, let's go a little deeper here down, 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 down an important path because everyone's seeing it in their social media, mm -hmm. hearing about it on the radio, can't turn a television on. Mm -hmm. You know, if you still watch a television <laughs> and, and watch news, but I mean, yeah. health challenges, it's right there. So Dr. Mm -hmm. Kendall, from your perspective, like well, what do you see is the biggest challenge right now? Well, I think the biggest challenge right now is the strain on, on our workforce. Yeah. Um, you know, starting of course with the very acute phases of the, the COVID pandemic and believe me, COVID is not over yet, mm -hmm. uh, but it has really exhausted the workforce. And uh, in many areas, we're finding that people are just losing, you know, the capacity to continue to work in very demanding roles. And um, I certainly uh, feel that one of the things perhaps we haven't seen is enough engagement of frontline workers by the Ministry of Health mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. government to really tap into what their experience is and how we can actually uh, modify it. Uh, there's a finite number of health human resources, but it's interesting. Uh, I talked to nursing colleagues who are very frustrated yeah. with, you know, the travel nurse phenomenon. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, there is companies that engage nurses and they pay them substantially more than you get through the Sun, you know, collective mm -hmm. agreement. Yeah. And they uh, go in various, you know, around the province. And when they're in an institution working with the other nurses, it isn't that they don't work as hard. It's just that they aren't quite as deeply invested in the community and mm -hmm. you know the, the setting because they, they they're they're sort of temporary yeah. and uh, I, I really think we need to try and um, bolster the the morale of our mm -hmm. workforce by listening to them appreciate that. that yeah Dr. Arini is there anything you want to add in terms of challenges yeah, definitely. Like one more aspect that I would um, add here, like is the focus on the health promotion. Like most of the time, like the curative aspect and rehabilitative aspects are where more of the investment goes. I'm not against it, but I'm saying that how about if like uh, more investment would have been on the health promotion aspect so that nobody gets sick and end up mm -hmm. into hospital or into the rehabilitation center. And again, like um, those could be encouraged like through the different routes while having more public health nurses and more public health professions 
um, in the community where people are gaining access to uh, those um, uh, providers who can actually help them in promoting their health. Mm -hmm. And here the role of the different professionals come into mm -hmm. account for uh, the health promotion. I would say that uh, during the pandemic, we have learned so much of the lesson for this aspect because I remember like um, I'm being a lactation consultant, I'm very much into the breastfeeding counseling aspect. But unfortunately, what I came to know that during the time of uh, COVID, when more requirement was there on the health promotion as well, apart from on the curative mm -hmm. and rehabilitative, the health promotion part was uh, like completely shut off. And most of those professionals who were previously responsible for providing the breastfeeding counseling services or uh, the, the education to the community were routed towards the ICU and to the emergency care units. So that was a domain that really made many people more sick than before because people were having the vaccine hesitancy even later because they were not getting the proper education or teaching that why this particular vaccine gonna be so important for them to prevent them. And people really had the different myths and different practices at that time as well. So this is another important aspect that I consider as a challenge that needs more kind of a thoughts in our healthcare system. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. just to build on that, yeah, that's okay. for sure, yeah. um, the misinformation issue is mm -hmm. so significant. I see that as a challenge that is really hard for any of us in yeah. our systems yeah. to, to manage. But misinformation about health treatment, health status. I mean, during COVID, obviously, that was a, a huge mm -hmm. problem. So misinformation, like how do we ensure that we teach our kids mm -hmm how to better discern what is accurate information, what what is inaccurate, mm -hmm. you know, being able to have that critical, that critical thinking, thinking <laughs> skill, yeah. exactly, mm -hmm. to know, okay, this is reality, this exactly. is not reality, this is valid information, mm -hmm. this is not. So I think that's, it's an opportunity, yeah. but yeah. it's a big challenge right it now. Is. And I think, uh, pinging again on the disinformation, particularly around mm -hmm. immunization, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, we had made such great advances in terms of childhood immunization, you know, preventing a lot yeah. of uh, childhood deaths, quite frankly, and serious illness. And uh, as a consequence of disinformation about immunization, you know, uh, the rates of childhood immunization are dropping and uh, that puts children at, at great risk. And it's very, very disappointing. Mm -hmm. that's well, and now we're seeing diseases coming back that yeah. we never yeah, thought measles. we'd see again, like yeah. measles. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. where we thought we'd, we, we'd been in the clear. Yeah. And now we're not. Yeah. We're kind of getting close to the end of this kind of first half of the show. So is there anything else percolating in you in these last couple of minutes yeah. that you want to mm -hmm. want to kind of share before we, we uh, hand it over to our fellows on the desk there that's going to lead us into, into part two of this? Well, <clears throat> I, I do want to comment on a, a new story that broke sure. you know, this week about... Uh, the fact that the uh, you know the government of Saskatchewan had not really listened to the public health officers who wrote about steps that ought to be taken to protect the population during the peak of the COVID yeah. pandemic, and um, uh, it is very very concerning that we've lost the respect for expertise vested in people like public health officers. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there was the phrase that we're not going to have these restrictions because we don't want a Trudeau summer. And that just grieved my heart when I heard that because it was just politicization mm -hmm. of an issue which really should be driven by science and by, uh, you know, factual data from public health yeah. research and analysis. We have to get back to a strong public health standing where we deal with population health issues uh, as opposed to, you know, um, uh, succumbing to the disinformation. Yeah, and it's acceptable. Thank you for sharing mm -hmm. that. Because there's sensitivity right now yes. in the healthcare system. Yes. Depending on your role, Tracy, being in a hospital, mm -hmm. you've got there's sensitivities around what you can say, what you can't say, yeah. you know, how you can how you can navigate it. And I know as a professor, you know, there's you've got some liberties that you can take there, but there's also within the bigger structure there. Any thoughts, Tracy, from yourself or Dr. Herney? I'll just add that mm -hmm. 
I think one of the big opportunities we have is to get back to using data to make decisions. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. We have databases. Mm -hmm. We have information. We have to use it to guide us into mm -hmm. the right decisions. Mm -hmm. um, good example, we have known what our demographics have been for a long time. We should not be in a situation where we're, we don't have uh, capacity to serve seniors in long-term mm -hmm. care. We've known that that bubble mm -hmm. was on the rise a long time mm -hmm. ago, mm -hmm. and we didn't use the data to mm -hmm. make the decisions at the time to make sure we had the capacity mm -hmm. to meet the needs. Mm -hmm. So we have to, this is a lesson, <laughs> let yeah. it be a lesson. We have to use data to guide decisions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, thanks yeah. for that. No, perfect. Well, that brings us to the end of our first half and great conversations. I can't wait for the second half. So, yeah, I guess we'll see you all on the second half. Don't forget to um, follow us on our social media, The Voice of Saskatoon and Civically Speaking. So, yeah, great, great show. Thanks. Welcome back to the second part of our show. We are the Voice of Saskatoon and Civically Speaking. We have three great speakers today. Um, we have Dr. Kendall, we have Tracy Mugley, and on the internet, on the on our social media, we have Dr. Harnai. So I'm very excited for the second part of this conversation. And again, don't forget to follow us on our socials, the Voice of Saskatoon and Civically Speaking. This will be posted there as well for later. So over to you, Madhuju. This show is about our community, about us, and uh, so we're going to announce something special that's happening in our community, a community event. It's a multicultural event that's happening. It's the African Heritage Fundraising Night that's taking place on May 3rd, and uh, it's being organized by Truly Alive Youth and Family Foundation and also the Rotary Club of Saskatoon. You can go into their website and uh, look at the tickets and if you're interested, maybe you can join on this good, uh, good event. Uh, before coming to the question, as, as listening to the whole uh, conversation about the challenges and what we can do, just, just uh, looking at a holistic sort of statistic, WHO said last year that only in 2022 year-to-year -year increase was 25% for mental health pandemic. And they're saying it as a pandemic because of so much of youth that are getting, uh, you know, getting in, into the grasp of it. Uh, we know we have uh, our, our doctors and nurses are, are doing their best. But I think sometimes we just have to take a step back and see what we can do for ourselves. And not just for ourselves, maybe our friends, our family, our community members. Uh, just, just say a quick hi, just a text or something, mm -hmm. just to just to check on to them. Now, going on to the interesting questions, I'll start with uh, Dr. Kendall. So, we 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 all talked about uh, many many challenges and uh, you know maybe long term long term initiatives that we can take. Uh, what would be something that you know can bring us some some quick wins, just mm -hmm. just that we need in, in the short term? Well, when we talk about quick wins, uh, I think uh, people often have a different understanding of what that means. If we're talking about a single policy, for instance, that if you changed a policy today, you know immediately there would be a change in the health status of the population or or, or other measurable changes. That's unlikely to happen. In terms of uh, both a quick win but an enduring win, uh, win, I'd like us to really focus on what we can do to retain our existing workers in the system because we're losing people. People are actually dropping out because they just can't tolerate the strain anymore. And um, I think that we often have so much focus on recruitment so our you know our government has a big recruitment initiative to try and attract people from elsewhere we attract often healthcare workers from third world countries where they desperately need them more than we do but you know mm -hmm. the lure of coming to a developed country and earning more money and sending it back home is, mm -hmm. is quite a lure 
So rather than trying to uh, put all this energy into attracting people from away, I'd like to see more energy putting into retaining our, our, our workforce and making sure that their, their working conditions are, are conducive to continuing to enjoy their, their careers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Kendall. Now off to Dr. Hiani. Thank you so much for this opportunity. So I would say that many times like in our um, system, we do have like various other aspects that we need to highlight on. And I would say that our next generation. So here my focus is on the young children's health and um, they are the one who gonna be the future mm -hmm. uh, weightlifter of our nation mm -hmm. in Canada. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, like whenever like I work in my research and I do see that so much of the lesser investment for the younger generation, especially um, in he every health clinic nowadays, I'm seeing that um, mothers are being offered the formula samples. And here like um, we don't understand that how much implication it is having on the economical kind of a burden for the whole family and once like the formula sample is offered to the moms like they believe that probably if doctor has given me or like healthcare providers has given me then probably they are giving me the right advice to and uh, to go ahead with at that time rather than any breastfeeding counseling and here i have seen many families that um, who had the children who ended up into the GI problems, uh, the gastrointestinal problems in a very early stages of their lives. Many children ended up into a kind of a learning deficit or like a kind of a learning um, issues when they were in the school. And many were having the immunity based issue with a very low immunity, struggling with those type of the health issues very early phase of their lives which is not at all good for our like younger generation because they are the weightlifter, as I said, for our nation. Mm -hmm. So here I would emphasize that like instead of uh, having something uh, which is a formula like breastfeeding counseling while having more lactation consultants um, in our like province or in Canada would actually benefit more. In Canada, like uh, um, I would say that we have very uh, low number of uh, institutions who are with the baby friendly initiative status. In the uh, rest of the world, there are like all the health organizations and even the hospital settings are trying to have this accreditation so that they can support more mothers to have their breastfeeding continued minimum for at least two years um, or beyond. The first six months should only be the breast milk that should be offered to the baby without any water, without any other kind of the juices or any other kind of a cultural food. So nothing in the first six months. And after that, mother can have the weaning diet with the breast milk continued up to two years and beyond. So that's what something if the more emphasizes on and that would be the kind of a health promotive strategies for our younger generation because breast milk is something that is nutritionally right it can offer the great ingredients for their brain development it also promotes the emotional bonding uh, between the mom and the babies can also prevent the young babies from the variety of infections so this is one of those examples and many such projects on the childhood immunization, the community-based education are few other aspects and also main focus of the healthcare providers if um, are on the early brain development, that would be something really great start for our younger generation from the health perspective that can actually benefit uh, the society at large. So that's what my perspective uh, that really require uh, the more thoughts again. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Dr. Hirani. I'll, I'll throw it off to Tracy. Yeah. So quick wins. I think there's yeah, things we can... Good luck with that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think there's things we can leverage yeah, yeah. that are yeah. on their way. And one of those would be, uh, I'm really impressed with the public school divisions um, campaign to address literacy mm -hmm. uh, for kids up to grade three, knowing that that literacy is such a key indicator of future success for mm -hmm. kids. 
So I think we can leverage that mm. and invest. That can be an immediate investment that, that can be made. Um, but I think the other one is around investing in anti-racism and reconciliation because we have to be able to build trusting relationships and I'm thinking a lot here about mm -hmm. substance use and mm -hmm. mental health. We have to be able to develop uh, meaningful relationships with people, mm -hmm. help people feel safe to engage in care. Mm -hmm. So if, if we can't uh, um, be culturally responsive and engage with people in that way, we're not going to be able mm -hmm. to move to that next step of, of trust where we can provide care. So those would be mm -hmm. two things I think mm -hmm. could be immediately invested in. Mm -hmm. But I think there's another realm that I have some thoughts on, and it's actually palliative care. I think we can make some immediate investments in palliative care education. Mm -hmm. We talk a lot about, you know, what can we do for uh, folks, you know, throughout mm -hmm. their life, but end of life is really important time mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. And I think we can invest in more education across the healthcare spectrum mm -hmm. for people working in that realm to understand how to deliver mm -hmm. good end of life care. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that is something we can do pretty quick and pretty immediately. There's education uh, um, forums out there that we can latch on to. Mm -hmm. um, there's people interested, and you know, from a fundraising perspective, it's amazing mm -hmm. how ready people are mm -hmm. to give funds yeah. to things related to end of life. Yeah. 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 Uh, when we did our campaign for hospice at Glengarda, yeah. it was right. a $10 million campaign. We yeah. raised $22 million. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's some opportunities there to really yeah. work on yeah. good end of life care too. Yeah, yeah. 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 those are some yeah. really great examples. Thanks mm -hmm. for your quick wins. Yeah. Any other quick win that comes to mind before we yeah. hand it over to Rashid? Supportive housing, gotta okay. say it. Yeah, yeah. We just need to really invest in uh, mm -hmm. housing that has support systems yeah. around it yeah. to help people mm -hmm. yeah. to be successful yeah. mm -hmm. in their independence. Yeah. It's one of the main issues that comes up, yeah. and mm -hmm. not just in Saskatoon, but all over our yeah. country and beyond. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so housing, housing the unhoused, yeah. and all of that, and looking at the whole wraparound effect of it and transitions mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. all of that. So yeah, yeah. I appreciate you bringing yeah. that up. Over to you. Well, thank you so much. And uh, I'm really enjoying the conversation and learning a lot about healthcare system today. Uh, we discuss about opportunities, we discuss about challenges and shortcomings. So uh, I will start the conversation with Tracy. So my question is what really needs to be the long term focus mm -hmm. in terms of sustainability mm -hmm. and, like, you know, for future en enhancement? Yeah, mm -hmm. I think a lot of it has to do with planning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have to plan thoughtfully. We have to look at what our demographics are telling us. I mean, there will be a time mm -hmm. where we'll have a lot fewer seniors and a lot more mm -hmm. younger people. Yeah. So we have to plan ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, this is going to affect us in education, for example, uh, and healthcare, all our systems all our government delivered services. So using data to make decisions is really key. Um, but I'm gonna go back to the determinants of health mm -hmm. because we have mm -hmm. to think about what is it that causes unwellness? Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. is it that mm -hmm. it promotes good health? And those are the determinants that we have to invest in. If we invest mm -hmm. in the determinants, if we invest in income security, food security, recreation, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, issues related to anti-racism, we will actually build a healthier society. Mm -hmm. So uh, those are short-term, long-term, they're just all the time yeah. things yeah. that we yeah. need to yeah. be doing, yeah. so yeah. Well, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like we have to invest not only in the healthcare, but in the society and like mm -hmm. other factors as well so that we can improve mm -hmm. uh, longer yeah. sustainability. Yeah. So, and, and I'll say one more thing yeah. about uh, health human resources, because I mean, in the short term, I guess we have a bit of a win because we have had an investment mm -hmm. to create more seats in physio physical therapy and occupational mm -hmm. therapy school, which is really important. Uh, more nursing seats, uh, the introduction of a physician assistant program, we're not sure exactly what that will look like yet, but um, there's at least some forward thinking and knowing mm -hmm. that we need those health human resources and that we have to educate people right here in our community and in mm -hmm. our province mm -hmm. so that people will stay in, and serve in our province, like you say, the retention mm -hmm. aspects. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Same question to uh, Dr. Kendall. Well, I, I think long term, one of the things that I, I, I really uh, think we need to be mindful of is 
we actually led this nation in 1962 in introducing, um, you know, publicly funded medically necessary physician services, now called Medicare. Mm -hmm. And in 67, it became a national program. And uh, it's interesting that we have this phenomenon in which, you know, we guarantee that all physician services that are deemed medically necessary are paid out of public funding so that no person can buy themselves to the head of the line. But we're seeing in a number of provinces, including Saskatchewan, a phenomenon in which, you know, there's an inclination now to have for-profit uh, delivery and you can pay your way to the head of the line. And I think that's socially irresponsible. I think mm -hmm. it will undermine the fabric of our society. Mm -hmm. And so I'd like us to remain steadfast in our commitment to sharing the cost of keeping our population well through our taxation and not mm -hmm. expecting people to actually pay mm -hmm. for it. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I think long term we need to be mindful of is <clears throat> if we can in fact uh, move towards team-based primary care mm -hmm. as the norm, um, mm -hmm. we need to have a diverse array of healthcare personnel working together as, as true team members to optimize the care. And if you get the foundational primary care services optimally operating, it reduces the reliance on much more expensive uh, interventions later on. So I think primary care needs to be a very long-term investment and uh, we need to change the compensation mm -hmm. model so that all of the workers can be working together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. And as we talk about society, compensation, so I will come back to Dr. Shehla if you want to add anything to the long-term investment. Another long-term investment that I can propose on is with regard to the sustainable developmental goals. Like um, nowadays, we do have like the whole set of sustainable development goals that uh, speak about the different aspects that can make this world a better place. And um, talking about specifically the climate action and climate change related investment is something equally important even from the perspective of health because even the climate uh, change is causing so much of the disaster mm -hmm. situation all over the world and even every day when we tune in um, to the news we're going to get to know that this area is affected by uh, wildfire mm -hmm. or like in this different part there are earthquakes mm -hmm. ongoing or the flooding in progress so to what extent like our healthcare system is so much well prepared to tackle the repercussions of all those climate related and climate change related uh, disasters that are happening um, every day in Canada all the time like every summer we do have the issue of wildfire that is affecting uh, like uh, the, the the great number of population who are even traveling or even many people are ending up into respiratory issues mm -hmm. because of that so to what extent like we are prepared to handle the a disaster that are happening every year and in the in the coming years there are chances we may face the massive disaster so that type of preparedness is something for which we need to think in advance to be able to uh, promote protect and health of everybody during that time in past, I've seen many healthcare providers are not very much well prepared of that, how to tackle situation whenever there are actual disaster. So, so much of their continuing education or even in their own curriculum, there should be more inbuilt um, on this aspect so that they can care for the population in a great way in long term. And we have to probably plan it in advance for that. And apart from that, I would also add on on the interdisciplinary collaboration between the healthcare providers. Like I have seen that many times, like people um, who are in a specific domain, for example, uh, psychologists, like uh, medicine, nursing, social work, at times like um, uh, they are, they they at times they work in their own entities. But now it's a time where we all have to join hand mm -hmm. and work as an interdisciplinary team to make a great change um, for the society at large, especially in Canada. 
Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, as you mentioned, like working together to mm -hmm. improve the system, so very, very important. I will pass it to Lenore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Just a follow-up question to EGU, because it begs the question, who else needs to be involved in this conversation? Mm -hmm. You know, apologies, we're picking on the healthcare folks, yeah. mm -hmm. right? And that, that's a heavy weight to bear. Yeah. But we know there's a heck of a lot more yeah. and a lot of others that are involved in this, but who else needs to be in this conversation mm -hmm. and why, mm -hmm. you know, and, and who's been maybe missing from the conversation and why? Mm -hmm. I can't think of anybody that should not be yeah. in the conversation, yeah. mm -hmm. to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we have to even ask, our, ask ourselves, what can we expect mm -hmm. of a healthcare system? We have very high expectations of uh, what we want for interventions and to keep us healthy and how far can we actually go yeah. to keep people alive and yeah. to uh, cure people and to fix people and how much can our system actually sustain. Mm -hmm. So even being able to address societal expectations yeah. Yeah. about what a healthcare system can do or mm -hmm. should do and what willing what are people willing to pay yeah. in order to have that mm -hmm. you know when when people are sick it's like a million dollars i'll give you a million dollars yeah. just yeah. help me yeah. live right but it's not a sustainable thing always and and that's where you see you know people wanting to go off to uh, a far-reaching clinic in the united states that does a very specialized service that nobody else in the world does you know the, those things aren't sustainable in systems, so I think we need a bigger conversation around what do we expect our healthcare system mm -hmm. to do, so we can work from there. That's a yeah, good question, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Building on that, Dr. Kendall. Well, I guess when we talk about being at a table, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we need to have obviously our elected leaders yeah. at the table, mm -hmm. because their role is to set public policy mm -hmm. that impacts mm -hmm. not just health care delivery but the mm -hmm. social determinants of health. Mm -hmm. uh, we obviously need citizen mm -hmm. engagement and uh, we need engagement of particularly vulnerable populations. Yeah. Um, and uh, you uh, mentioned Tracy you know the the need for you know uh, engagement of the uh, indigenous peoples. And uh, I think we're making some inroads there, but mm -hmm. uh, there's much that we yeah. can and should mm -hmm. learn from them about their understanding mm -hmm. of wellness and health. Yeah. And I do think that um, when I reflect on my own, you know, sort of journey in Saskatchewan, I grew up on a farm, you know, went to medical school, got a medical degree. Uh, got to do some really exciting things and I think often you read like well-researched papers, academic papers saying this is a plan but we don't get the right people together to actually implement it and so we do need to get you know mm -hmm. politically active yeah. leaders yeah. and all the other players at the same table. Mm -hmm. yeah, right now sure. it's a hierarchical process and at the end of the day, you know, the Ministry of Health calls most of the shots, and I'm not sure that that's a healthy environment. Yeah, those are mm -hmm. good points, very yeah. valid points. Going on to our guest on screen here. So here I would say that uh, very important to involve the patient partners, like uh, many times we design the mm -hmm. uh, programs, policies, and practices for people um, who are going to be the end users or to whom like things going to be applied to. Mm -hmm. But it's very, really, very really important to have a say of those individuals because um, whenever we involve patient as our partner, just like a health provider, policy maker, other stakeholder, governmental, non-governmental organization representative, or in, uh, so many others in the list similarly. But definitely when, whenever like we are going to be thinking into those lines where we are involving patient as our partner, we would be getting their perspective very, very clear. We would be getting to know that what their context is, what their needs are, mm -hmm. and to what extent like um, our design policies and interventions are need-based and culturally appropriate or even context appropriate. Mm -hmm. Many times like um, the, the, the problem that we face that we invested so much 
money into a program saying that, oh, this is the best program, maybe designed by people who thought that this is going to be the best because they had their perspective. But there wasn't the perspective of those individuals who to whom that going to be applied. So when we going to be involving them, we will be saving the great number of dollars in that mm -hmm. because right in the very beginning, we would be getting in the planning phase that what needs to be done and how it needs to be done what gonna work and what would not work mm -hmm. and what will assure the sustainability. So that's something when we have the whole feasibility assessment plan in front of us, that's when we can just have the right approach in place. So mm -hmm. I would always say the first person on the list should be uh, the patient partner's involvement in the discussions like these. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well. What a great discussion. Time went by too fast. That, that's what happens every time we have great conversations. But what I hear is we have come a long way in our healthcare and we have long ways to go. And we each have a role. We can either sit back and complain or we can take a more active part, make our voices heard. And yeah, tell people what we expect and what we want our healthcare to be so that they, people in, in, in charge, they can listen and they can give us what we need. But yeah, great discussion. Thanks again, Dr. Kendall. Thanks again, Tracy, for coming back to our show again and again. I'm sure we'll have you guys many more times. And Dr. Shayla for joining us today. It was great having you all and just a great show. I'm sure we'll be back with more great shows. And yeah, I hope you all enjoyed this episode. And yeah. I guess don't forget to follow our social. We'll be posting this video there as well. Share it with your friends, share it with your family so that they can hear these great conversations. And again, add comments to what they want, what they need, what's missing. So, yeah. Any thank last you so words? much. Yeah. yeah thank you, everyone. Thank Thanks you. Thanks to our guests. Much yeah. appreciation. Mm -hmm.